We'll begin, brother. <laughs> As brother mentioned, from 1 John 4, verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I like this topic because it, well, it's, it's my motto text, 1966. Getting old, so that's when I look back at that one. I go, wow, that's a really nice one. And when Brother Jolly said it'd be profitable for us to contemplate his glorious character, to appreciate more and more his greatest and noblest attribute of character. What do we know about love in terms of its definition? I think we've studied this. Every class has done this, and you have before. Uh, love is goodwill, and it fits both duty love or justice, and disinterested love. So we know, we look at the word, we have the Greek uses of that, the two different nouns for those. Philia, or duty love, so that's the goodwill that by right we owe to others, so that's that obligation. And then the agape love, or the disinterested love, a good that, apart from any duty or obligation, is given out of a delight in good principles. Keep that in mind as we go through it, a delight in good principles. So goodwill is the only quality that never disappears from the idea or expression of love. So it's really the essence of that. Now, I'm a big fan of you know, certain television shows, and one I like is, and Sister Anna and I watch this, is Bill Maher on, uh, on HBO. And Bill Maher is an atheist. And he's an atheist for all the right reasons. And, I, and what I mean by that is that he looks at some of the religious traditions that are out there, and he can clearly see that they're inaccurate. So then he looks at the whole picture, and he throws the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. But I appreciate him for seeing the errors that are in the systems for it. But last week he was on, and he, he talked about what he had said, I think it was 10 years ago, and talking about religion, and he kind of attacked the Ten Commandments. And he was looking at it and saying, well, there are these commandments out there they're kind of like Donald Trump and, and what they do and saying, you know, we only, they should have no other God before me and, well, you know, make no statues. Just make statues of me, he would say. Um, and if you're going to say things, uh, you know, if you should say things about me and that, and he even talked about the Sabbath thing too, about that being holy. So he was attacking Jehovah in a sense for some of the things he reads in those Ten Commandments. I highly recommend, if you ever have a chance, is listen to Dennis Prager's uh, YouTube uh, videos on the Ten Commandments. And then you realize how much love is behind the idea of the Ten Commandments and the reality of what's there. I'm also rereading the Bible this year, and as I go through it, I find myself, when you, when you read the Old Testament, you'll see that a lot of Christians look at the Old Testament from a perspective of that's kind of God in his judgment phase, or being harsh, and everything that happened in that time, versus what you see in the New Testament. In fact, a lot of Christians walk around with half the Bible. I, I hope they only paid for half of it if they're walking around with half of it. But they're missing out on what's in the entire Bible that does show in terms of God is love. But I want to go into kind of that discussion of how we know that God is love and the meaning of it. And we, like I said before, goodwill is always present. We want to make sure that love can express itself in a variety of forms. And, but it never goes without that goodwill. So some examples that we know of people who kind of, uh, with their children. We never had kids, but I understand how when you're harsh or you're dealing with your children, there is goodwill involved in that and dealing with some of the issues that are there. Now, my parents used to call me John Howard. My name is my middle name. They'd say John Howard whenever, whenever there was something that was wrong. And I'd say, okay, so that maybe that was goodwill on their part to point out, we're going to use your middle name to, to reference this, and then we're going to try to correct you on something. But there are certain qualities that they have when they would do that. Gentleness, leniency, long-suffering, those things may not exist all the time, but goodwill is always there. And we know Jesus did that. He rebuked the Pharisees in driving them out of the temple. 
He didn't show gentleness in that case, but he did show goodwill. And there are many expressions of love in which one or more of the graces are lacking, but there can never be an expression of love without goodwill. Luke 2.14, where it says goodwill to men, that's where the angels really, this is what they're saying, is love to men. So our text again tells us that God is love. So let's look at that disinterested love portion of it. That's an unselfish love that goes out to others in goodwill, regardless of consequences or sacrifices brought upon self because of it. And now in duty love, there is always an element of natural, but not sinful, selfishness. There's something there in terms of that duty. We have thankful goodwill or love to God for the good he has done to us. We have that duty love to him. And we love our neighbor as we would uh, with our subject to God's will, as we would have him love us too. So we want to have that kind of duty love, but disinterested love is not from these motives. It's not that selfish motive, because we delight in good principles. And that's apart from any selfish consideration. There are a lot of verses that show this. And I'll just give you a couple of them. John 14, 23. John 14, 23. These are all the New King James Version, by the way. Uh, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Another good one. First John, again, from what we've been reading here. For verses 8, and if you continue on, 4, 8 through 12, and here, here's verse 8 again, he does not love, does not know God, for God is love. And this is the love of God, was, and this, the love of God, was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Verse 10, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also loved, ought to love one another. And then verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So there are a lot of scriptures that point out this type of love that exists this delight in good principles. God's disinterested love, which we are to imitate, is based on that delight in good principles. Again, here are some good scriptures that point that out. Psalm 45, verse 7. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. Jeremiah 9.24. Jeremiah 9.24. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So when we study this, there are some different elements that we can look at. Elements in God's love. Again, it is a delight in or appreciation of good principles. He delights in and appreciates them because they are good. He must then not like bad principles in them and in action. So based on this delight in good principles, there is a second element in God's love. It's a delight, an appreciation of those who are in harmony with good principles. So he appreciates them because they're good, and then he also delights those who are in harmony with those good principles. A couple of scriptures here that shows this too. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. 
John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Psalm 146, verse 8. Psalm 146, verse 8. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. So he does not like those people, or he has a problem, that are irreformable, that do things that are evil. Uh, and that is shown in a few verses as well. We understand that the Lord wants those who love him and follow those same principles. The third element in God's love is based upon this delight of good principles, being in sympathy with the righteous and pity for the unrighteous. I always get some of those terms confused when you think of sympathy, pity, <coughs> empathy. So I got the definitions. Here we go. Sympathy is feeling compassion or sorrow. So it's a sympathy with the righteous. Again, is feeling compassion uh, and sorrow. Pity is for pitying the hardships that another encounters. So we'll read about that too. Empathy, on the other hand, which is not shown here, is putting yourself in the shoes of another. So you empathize based on those things. And when I looked at the definitions, you'll find that sympathy and empathy kind of often lead, one leads to the other, or vice versa. So you end up with sympathy, again, is feeling compassion and sorrow, so then by that, maybe you empathize by putting yourself into the shoes of that person. But back to our definition here, these four elements, this third one, is the sympathy with the righteous and the pity for the unrighteous. <laughs> the sympathy for the righteous, first of all, feels at one with them, is in heart unison with them. John 17, 11. John 17, 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And then verse 21, that they are all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 23, again, this is through John 17, verse 23. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. And then finally, verse 26. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So we kind of see, in terms of the sympathy that's there. In terms of the pity, it pities the unrighteous for their disharmonies, or being disharmonious, with those good principles, in their the sufferings that result from that, and in their being kind of being out of harmony with those good principles. So you can see in that sympathetic view as well in terms of as well as pity. Now the fourth one, and the final element of disinterested love, is kind of again a math equation, like I was talking about earlier. It's like taking these two appreciations and then you add in the sympathy and pity. So the delight from the above described appreciation and the sympathy or pity to sacrifice in order to further good principles in and for others. Try to seek to bring them into harmony with good principles and to oppose wrong principles for the rescue of others from those evil activities, those natures and effects. So again, it's almost like a math equation showing those two plus the sympathy and pity in order to understand that sacrifice to extend that. So from that analysis of those four component parts of disinterested love, we recognize that it's not really simple enthusiasm or sentimentality, but it's one of the best qualities that we have that's available, and that's what we have in terms of Jehovah. 
The greatest of these is charity, disinterested love. God in, a love in God's character is of the highest possible kind. Here's, here's a statement to keep in mind. It is part of his character more than any other of his character attributes. I love the fact that justice is the foundation for it, but that love is that higher part, that it is more of that. God is the personification of disinterested love. To whatever extent any of us possess that, to the extent that that person has that type in their character, that likeness to God, that's wonderful that you can work in that direction. Whoever is fully in God's likeness may uh, be said to be uh, to have love, for love is the greatest principle, uh, again, which represents most fully that divine character. And that's something we would certainly work at when we think of Christ's likeness and trying to do what's right. So who are those that have this type of love? Well, God. God is love. Jesus is love. We know that. The church in glory, the bride, and every, well, every one of the 144,000 who proved to be more than conquerors to love. And anyone really who's consecrated their life to God and have laid down self-will and accepted his will as their own in all things, if we're trying to, if we're diligently seeking to develop kind of God-likeness, again, I like to say Christ-likeness, it seems more attainable in that way, is to have disinterested love and to do as best as we can. And we don't have that maybe perfected or crystallized as maybe the church did, but that we try to do that in terms of our, our Christian walk. 1 John 2, 5. 1 John 2, verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And if we yield ourselves to him, that will help work out that transformation. Philippians 2, 13. Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Hebrews 13, 21. And make you a complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. So we have to cooperate in trying to do those things. <coughs> and we have to work out our own salvation in, uh, with fear and trembling. So there is that hope of attaining that likeness of that divine character. And it's a pretty <coughs> big ambition to get there. Uh, it's Again, people don't really see it when they read the Bible and they look at certain things. They, they only think, if looking at the Old Testament, of the harsh portion of Jehovah. And if in, in the New Testament, then they look mostly to Jesus. And they sometimes don't see the bigger picture that's there for the entire Bible. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Although every good and perfect gift comes from the Heavenly Father, there really is a difference between a gift and a fruit. A gift can be acquired immediately, but fruit requires time. We talk about that. I'm sure we've, you've talked about this many times. So it's with that fruit of the Spirit that we want to understand this. We see the wisdom of God here. That there's development is a gradual work. And those that have that desire and determination and the zeal for righteousness, they can develop that. They can continue that development of disinterested love. Does our Heavenly Father expect us to be perfect in doing that? I would hope not, not in this life, not for us, to have that perfection of this type of love in our fallen flesh. Our, that weakness that we have, those imperfections, don't permit us to do that. But he certainly expects us to do our best and to demonstrate that we can continue in our character development. So in order for us to reach this degree of character, this development, <coughs> we can't live after the flesh. We can't think of the old mind, the old disposition. 
but we have to train our minds on those things which are true, pure, loving, and good. So there's that, again, thinking of the truth and the spirit of truth earlier, those things go hand in hand in that development. So it's in this sense of the word that we are to be copies of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We know how the church, in terms of its development, the great company, these worthies, ancient worthies, here we are, well into the millennium, and we're still, in terms of our those of us here, dealing with our character development. Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that, uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here's a question. Is kindness always love? Is it that way? Well, let's take a look at that. Kindness really isn't always love. Because you can be kind, but you may have the wrong intention. So if we're denying the self-will and laying down that self-will and we've accepted to do the will of God, if we understand it, then we should have a certain sentiment of how we deal with others and to have that loving interest. Now, it may not always be wise in, in how we exercise this kindness and love, Sometimes that comes from, from a different um, interest. You may not have the right motive. So you could be kind, but in terms of what it does, it may not really apply to love. Kindness is prompted by motives other than love and occasion, so for those selfish reasons. So you have to be careful in terms of thinking that kindness in of itself means love. All it proves to us is that we're always learning. And it's the continual schooling and everything that we do, that we're learning more and more. It's in discovering our own imperfections that we should learn as a matter of course, as a matter of action, that we shouldn't expect perfection in others either. And we need to give them credit for doing their best in whatever uh, situation, and to look at, to that from those imperfections that they have, that they are, too are trying to learn. So if kindness isn't always love, well, let's flip that around and go the other way. Well, love is always kind. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, I'm going to read some other verses within that, but I'll read that one just now. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It cannot willfully injure another. So again, you get back to if you're dealing with family members or issues, and as a boss at work, you're always dealing with people in a certain way. You're always trying to do something that will harm them. You want to help them. That's the intent. You might make a mistake in how you're doing it, but the motive is proper, and you're trying to do that in a loving and kind and true way. It may be perceived as unkind. It might be appeared that way. So love might sometimes be regarded as unkind. Maybe it's certain actions that things are misunderstood. Uh, when Adam and Eve were forbidden from partaking of the fruit, while there was a wise and loving reason behind it, it was for their protection. <clears throat> but he knew that eventually they may be permitted to partake of that fruit. But in kindness, it was on his part, it was kindness on his part to keep them in ignorance of that fact. And we look at our own examples in terms of those things where something that we intended to be to as kindness, that love that was there, but it came across as being perceived as unkind. What about the power of indwelling love? This is really about knowing our limitations. Man was originally made in the image of God, that we know of Genesis 1, 26, and 27, but by 
the fall of Adam. Now that's where the balance of mind has been kind of destroyed. You know, maybe maybe you think you're okay, but you start to realize over time you're not. That in our fallen condition, we do have very severe limitations. But if you try to do the Lord's will, if you have the mind or will of Christ, you can overcome some of these inequalities of those natural dispositions that you have. That's the part that there's a class that, we, that we're taking at work, and it's talking about gratitude. And gratitude is that understanding that you know you're, you have, you're gracious and gra have a gratitude for some other thing. So it's it's realizing your own limitations and the appreciation of having that. And by, if you're walking in a Christian walk, if you appreciate the true state of affairs of the fallen human condition and your own condition, and you're trying to do the Lord's will, why? Now that is, that's a massive blessing. That's a blessing to us to realize our own limitations and not to elevate ourselves to a point in a, in a belief that we know everything. <coughs> And, that's, and then we see others who have that small appreciation as well. We kind of are happy to see, see them, too, that they also have that understanding. It brings you to the understanding of the spirit of a sound mind. That the spirit of a sound mind really comes from having a proper understanding of our own limitations. And re realizing and appreciating the blessings that we have from God. This knowledge of that imperfect condition of humanity really should humble us, and it shouldn't puff us up. So what about knowledge and disinterested love? Again, humility comes to mind, and that's based off of, again, that kind of knowledge and grace. And if you just have all knowledge, but you don't have grace for it, then you get out of balance. So if knowledge is not accompanied by disinterested love, then you get where it puffs, puffs up. And I'll, again, I'll do some verses I'll read for that. So indwelling love has the power to build up, to strengthen character, and to counteract the wrong effect of the fallen human nature. What about proper and improper? And the word that was used that I found in one article talked about proper and improper provocations. Well, provocation is more of an action or something in speech. So the whole world has a tendency to recognize the principle of justice. People want justice. And they're looking for it nowadays. They don't know where to find it. They don't know how to apply it. They don't know if things, from their perspective, if that's justice for everyone. But they crave for that opportunity to fight injustice, and even they, they don't have a full definition of it. Sometimes it manifests itself in the wrong way, in acts of violence, uh, when you have different, like a mob mentality, and you see that in certain climates in certain places, where in certain political things. <clears throat> and they try to seize that opportunity to try to make things right. But the Lord's people, we don't want to be intolerant. We should not possess a spirit of intolerance. We should have pity, sympathy, and understanding when things go wrong, and should make due allowance, try to allow for those things, uh, those who are the transgressors, those who are doing the wrong. And instead of quickly rushing to judgment for the injustice that's there. Again, back to our fallen condition. God in his justice and love, he pities us for our fallen condition. Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. Psalm 103, 13 and 14. As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our friends. He remembers that we are dust. And as we develop and exercise his love, we will be long-suffering and forbearing to others, looking for the good intent of the heart, rather than just those imperfections of the fallen flesh.
I had stated earlier, God is the very personification of love. But if you look, the scriptures show us that he has been provoked to anger at different times. When he was passing through the wilderness, the children of Israel kind of forced him to say that word. He dealt with them repeatedly. This is where that kind of judgment has come in, the perception from the Old Testament. But it was trying to show that they couldn't, if they weren't staying to the law, they weren't continuing to follow his, his rules, that he would have to deal with them. So he did have those few occasions to deal with Israel. The time when they, had, they were sent into the captivity of Babylon, too. Think of the different times where he tried to get them back on track. And then eventually he had to say, all right, I have to wash my hands of this for a while. And off to Babylon and into that captivity that they, uh, for a number of years. Or even in terms of the rejection and, uh, of, and crucifixion of, our, of Jesus, that brought a certain wrath upon them as well. And they were dispersed around the world. So you could see that even though he's a very personification of love, he still had to deal with in terms of justice and those things to, for correction. The term we've used before is righteous indignation. And again, that's a word I don't use all that much, anger or annoyance, which is provoked by what is perceived as unfair treatment. So righteous <coughs> indignation, it's a proper feeling. In imitating and developing God's love in ourselves, we are not to be of that immovable kind that cannot feel or any resentment against injustice. Lack of ability to have just indignation would imply lack of moral fiber and of, and of harmony with God. So we can't just kind of push things off to the side and let them go either. Like him, we need to be holy, should be holy out of sympathy with everything, not in harmony with God. But we should be careful not to permit our righteous anger to cause us to sin. We want to make sure that we have it in the proper sense. Righteousness and iniquity, or that immoral or unfair behavior, we are to love righteousness and hate iniquity. A person who is indifferent to iniquity, indifferent to matters of right and wrong, is indifferent to the character of God, who is love, and who is therefore in opposition to all forms of iniquity. Psalm 45, verse 7. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All who are cultivating character pleasing to God all who are endeavoring to become exact copies of his son, of Jesus, should put away every impurity, everything that's not right. In terms of pity, if we have love as God has it, we will hate the wrong, but not hate the individual who does wrong. And in proportion of how as love controls our minds and hearts, we will feel pity for those of mankind who are in iniquity. And remember where we are in terms of the timeline. That mankind has fallen, and we're way far away from the original perfection that we had back in Adam. We have to look and think maybe evil is not their intention. That they are from a, a suffering from this fallen condition. So love is definitely charitable, and it tries to find different circumstances and to uh, extenuating circumstances and conditions for those actions. And it seeks to help the evildoer or the person who's doing this one and to, and to not be easily provoked to anger. The word provoke signifies to incite. In Hebrews 10, verse 24, <coughs> The Apostle says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love, copy love, and to good works. 
Love should say and do those things that will incite to loving words rather than stir up bitterness, which leads to anger, wrath, malice, strife, and many other things. <clears throat> it's better to do things and try to be a peacemaker than to go in the other direction and just, again, stir up the pot. What about the degree of love, that strength of love? It's like turning up the oven a little bit. What temperature do you want to have then? That strength may be determined by the ease with which it may be turned or roused to opposition or to impatience and anger. We have seen many times where when patience ceases to be a virtue, and it might be in the way of the real interest where you should step up and stand up for something, where love would ask you to take steps to correct what seems to be an apparent evil. But again, it's that balance of mind or judgment that we have to have. So perfection of decision is a quality belonging to Jehovah and to Jesus and to the little flock. And those, I mean, pretty much what we're talking about, those who have uh, crystallized their character. And we certainly want to work our way towards that. So God is provoked to anger by really anything trivial, I would hope. Uh, he looks upon the heart. We can't read that. We have no ability to read the heart. Sister Ann and I were in Madison, Wisconsin, and they, there were, you, you could go in, there was a, a palm reader. And so you could go in and have your palm read. I, we didn't do it. I don't really you know, waste our money on that kind of thing. So she has, this person has some special ability to read your palms and to tell you your future. But uh, we know it's all kind of silly, but in a weird way, sometimes we think we have certain abilities and that we can read the heart of others, and we can't. So we have to be very careful about how we balance those judgments and to not make hasty decisions. We want to grow in that disinterested love, <clears throat> that love of good principles, to be more and more like Jehovah. So love is really shown well again in 1 Corinthians 13, and I read verse 4, and I'd like to read a few other verses as part of the close of my talk. We will appreciate more to imitate Jehovah and to have to understand his character of love as we go through this. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 13. And this is where Paul kind of delineates the spirit of love. Again, New King James Version. Love suffers, verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. So it's even to the wrongdoer. Love does not envy anybody else's success or other things. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. There's that humility. Verse 5, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, Bears all things, believes all things, hopes in all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Verse 9, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And then again, in verse 13, and we're all familiar with this, and now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Of all the graces of God's Holy Spirit, love is the greatest from that last verse there. And it is the greatest of all of God's four great attributes of character. Again, wisdom, justice, and love, and power, all necessary, all important. But we understand what that love means and where that occupies such a high place in his character. That it's the only one of the four identified with his very being. So we trust that 
our understanding of this, of this type of love, this disinterest in love, and what Jehovah has, is something that we can look to, that we want to try to emulate and do our best in our Christian walk. May the Lord add his blessing.